Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone in the room, and we've got about uh, 50 people online as well. So, uh, good afternoon and welcome. My name is uh, I'm Julian Demkew. Uh, I am the University Secretary and Chief Governance Officer for the University of Saskatchewan, and this is the uh, annual meeting of the General Academic Assembly. Um, the uh, quorum uh, for the GAA is 150, uh, and uh, at the moment we uh, do not have quorum. Um, it's not unusual. Um, only twice in the 27-year uh, history of the General Academic Assembly has the, the general meeting uh, attained quorum, and that was actually even right in the early years of 1996. Um, so with that, we, uh, we don't have a, a formal uh, agenda, but that actually doesn't uh, prevent us from still being able to um, listen and uh, ask questions uh, during the State of the Union address, a State of the uh, University address, uh, sorry. <laughs> Be the same. It actually does state in the University of Saskatchewan Act, at each annual meeting of the Assembly, the President shall present a report respecting the state of the University and any other matters that the President considers appropriate. So with that, um, once uh, the President is done speaking, we actually will have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we have microphones um, both on the floor and uh, at the top for, uh, I think, the two people that are upstairs. Um, and uh, if you can, uh, if you are online, uh, you can uh, send questions to governance.office at usas.ca and we will uh, try to include them as much as possible in here as well. So, so with that, I will call up uh, President Stoichev. Thank you very much, Julian, and welcome everybody. And I want to acknowledge, of course, at the beginning of this occasion that uh, we are on Treaty 6 territory in the traditional homeland of the Métis and we pay our respects to our First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and every day work hard to reaffirm our relationships with one another. Um, I'm not that prone to giving really formal speeches but this is legislated in the University of Saskatchewan Act as Julian was saying and it goes on the university record Every one of these GAA speeches is publicly available, and so I do tend to move into a mode of giving a formal speech. I'm not exactly apologizing for that. I'm just sort of explaining why I'm, I'm a little more formal in my comportment right now than, than I ordinarily am. It, I've flirted with the idea, actually, of just giving something extemporaneously with a bunch of notes in front of me. but. In the end, I actually feel that I would end up doing an injustice to the important things that I do believe need to be said. So um, I, I therefore develop a, a script for this. So thank you all for attending. Um, I know there are student leaders here. There are members of our Board of Governors here. There are faculty here. There are staff here. Lots of people who really feel strongly about this great university. And of course, that is what I want to talk about. So the General Academic Assembly address is an opportunity, and it is legislated in the Act, for the President to deliver a State of the University. I did bring a State of the Union speech too, but I won't read that one out. <laughs> address. And each of the previous seven that I've given, this is actually the eighth, believe it or not, had a unique theme to it. I didn't want to wander all over the place. Uh, I wanted to focus on something specific. And those themes have ranged from connectivity, the ways in which internally we can work together, to the ways in which we can engage with our many external stakeholders and potential partners. So the themes have ranged from connectivity to diversity to creativity to visionary change to our role in meeting the COVID-19 challenge and the post-pandemic university. And in each one of these as well, I've tried to give a snapshot of the significant advances the university has made over the previous year. And that's actually a real challenge for anybody who's giving a talk like this because there have been so many extraordinary achievements that you end up leaving many of them out. And I can tell you I hear about that after I give the talks. But it's not my intention to do that, I'm sure, and I hope you know. Uh, and I try to be as comprehensive as I possibly can. The University of Saskatchewan stories are important to tell and they are full of extraordinary achievement and impact and these stories are created by many people. I've become increasingly fascinated by the history of this university, not to say its future as well. But these stories are created by so many people, including those in this room and watching this address. Thank you for joining online and by those who have come before us in service to this great university and the province that it's named after. These stories help us see to the horizon 
and these stories help us to see beyond the horizon. I'm struck by just how much has been accomplished despite, and I won't go through them all, but previous GAA addresses did, despite the many challenges that we have all faced together. We continue to contribute, and I hope that you can feel and believe this. We continue to contribute to some of the greatest causes of our time, and we are a beacon of hope and possibility for so many. I've been saying for a while now that universities are needed more than they have ever been. For those of you who have attended convocations, you've heard me say it there. I've said it to governments, I've said it at the U15, I've said it at Universities Canada, I've said it in the media, I've said it uh, in these, uh, on these occasions as well. The universities are needed more than they have ever been and that the University of Saskatchewan is needed more than it has ever been. When I first started saying that, there was quite a bit of skepticism. Aren't there many other sectors that are more important than they have ever been, not just ours, and don't they outreach ours in significance? Aren't there global challenges that other sectors are better positioned to solve than ours is? But I have an answer for that. And the answer is that not one of those challenges is going to be addressed, can be addressed, in the absence of universities such as ours. Governments can't do it alone, nor can any other sector. And we learned that from the pandemic, but we've known that before. University graduates will be the leaders of those conversations and solutions. University faculty and students will be the researchers who contribute to their solutions. That's why I'm inspired daily by the invocation that we know well now to be the university the world needs. It's the right call to action for our time. It shows that our mission is to be engaged and that we understand the importance of the great opportunity we've been handed, every one of us, to make a positive difference in the world. So I use this year's GAA address to take stock of our recent progress in becoming the university the world needs. How do we assess our impact in this regard? Let me start with awards and recognitions. If that's the case, let's acknowledge over the last academic year alone the 3M National Teaching Fellowship, one of the most prestigious teaching awards in Canada and the 10th to faculty at our university, by the way. The Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarships received by students studying here, the Rhodes Scholarship, the 73rd in our history, the many Order of Canada recognitions conferred by Rideau Hall to faculty and alumni, the Governor General's History Award for scholarly research, the Fulbright Research Awards to our students, the Banting Postdoctoral Fellowships to attract and retain top tier talent in Canada, faculty member inductions into the Saskatchewan Agricultural Hall of Fame, or into the 2022 Influential Women in Canadian Agriculture Group the naming of a College of Medicine alumnus as president of the Canadian Medical Association, the invitation of our faculty to speak at the COP27 UN Climate Change Conference in Egypt in November, and at the United Nations Water Conference in New York last month, of our provost to speak at the UN Food and Agriculture meetings in Rome and the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in New York, the invitation of our VP Research to be part of the recent extraordinarily influential Bouchard Advisory Panel on the Federal Research Support System, the honoring of five faculty with top provincial health awards, and another with the Excellence in Medical Leadership Award. And our Husky student athletes and coaching staff continue to impress with top-ranked academic accomplishments, athletic records, and accolades including two consecutive Vanier Cup appearances, bronze in the Western Track and Field Championships, and the decision to host the Women's National Hockey Finals here next year. That list is really only a start. Which leads me to say, by the way, the reference to the Huskies, that uh, today does mark the fifth anniversary of the Humboldt Broncos tragedy. That was exactly five years ago today, and we gathered in this hall, it was packed, on that occasion to mourn and to pay our respects. To, ask, to assess our impact, we can also look at world rankings. We placed 58th out of more than 1,400 universities worldwide assessed by the 2022 Times Higher Education or THE University Impact Rankings that measure our success in advancing the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. That 58th place ranking 
is a jump of 38 spots from our impressive position of before. It's particularly noteworthy because that group included 300 additional universities to the years before. If we want to assess our impact, global impact rankings, and that's what they are, the THE global impact rankings, are a good place to start. We achieved our best ever rankings in the latest THE World University rankings by subject. For the first time, we placed in the top 500 in every one of the 11 broad subject areas, every one of those. That's the first time in our history. And saw improvements in many of those categories as well, including in the humanities, education and law, while not dropping in any category. The Shanghai rankings placed us in the top 100 worldwide in water resources, first in Canada, 23rd globally. Veterinary sciences, fourth in Canada and 51st to 75th globally. And environmental science and engineering, sixth in Canada and 76th to 100th globally. The other major international subject ranking is the QS. And there, released just a couple of weeks ago, we are in the top 100 in the world in two areas, veterinary science and agriculture. And for the first time, we received a top 500 ranking in three categories in one year, and several other single subjects were in the top 500. Make no mistake, rankings aren't just points of pride for making speeches. They're a way of independently validating and measuring our progress and the ability that we may or may not have to talk about our own successes. And we must continue to improve in those rankings. Make no mistake about that either. But the importance is in this, that students from around the world who aspire to study in Canada scrutinize those rankings as they decide where to apply to study. This is in part why we have students from over 130 countries worldwide studying here and why our international student numbers grew by 6.2% this year. Institutional and subject ranking success promotes the development of partnerships with universities across the world for the benefit of our researchers and our students and rankings also support our students who aspire to study at excellent universities after they graduate from here. Or we can look at our research income over the last year. In the annual StatsCan results announced recently, collated by Research InfoSource, and that's what these numbers come from and are known as, but they're actually driven by Statistics Canada, we had our highest ever placement in the rankings, highest ever. Tenth among the 50 universities ranked and the largest percentage increase of any medical doctoral university in this country. Examples of the research support that is continuing this upward trajectory for us over the past year, and there are many, include funding for research on carbon sequestration and other agriculture-related support to address complex challenges faced by the agriculture and agri-food sectors. An ecological research team has received tri-council funding for an interdisciplinary project to study environmental changes in Western Canada's boreal plains. Our faculty have received funding to address Indigenous-specific racism in Canadian academies. Others will be working alongside Inuit artists to explore the power of traditional storytelling practices. Others, the food security of Afghanistan households. Others, to support the ground-penetrating radar and oral history research at four Saskatchewan First Nations. Yet others receive funding to address the systemic biases that challenge Indigenous youth sports activities. Our faculty have been funded to improve rapid diagnostic testing for bovine re respiratory disease, to study carbon sequestration to mitigate climate change, to undertake patient-oriented research, and to develop the world's first bison genome biobank. Our researchers are also funded to study the potential for recycled materials, to be used to build durable roads in climates with significant temperature swings between seasons, and if successful, this research will reduce potholes in cold climates. The Canada Foundation for Innovation Major Science Initiatives, or you would know it as the MSI program, available to all 97 universities in the country, this past year awarded 25% of its entire budget to this university alone to keep Canada at the forefront internationally in vaccine development, imaging science, sustainable water management, and space weather monitoring. 
That's extraordinary success, and there's no other university in the country that can say anything close to that. But the funding brought in, that was not my point, the funding brought in is not the only story. It's just a condition that enables it. The primary story is what our faculty and students and postdocs have been doing over the past year alone in terms of research scholarly and artistic work activity, partly as a result of that funding. For instance, Canada is the only G7 nation that does not have a national school food program, and our researchers are partnering with community agencies to inform federal decision-making on a nationally harmonized school food program. Our researchers are creating a digital archive of provincial residents' experience with the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that their stories and material can prepare the province to better cope with future health crises. Our researchers are helping the province develop a long-term strategy for delivering health services remotely, researching the mental health of new immigrant youth in Regina, and playing a critical role in a new national patient-driven network addressing the challenges of heart failure, which disproportionately impacts Indigenous peoples. Our multiple sclerosis research is extremely promising, as are our cancer research and rheumatoid arthritis work. We're examining how genetic mutations and immune systems are linked to blood cancers, and we're undertaking cutting-edge imaging that is yielding new insights into strokes. Our Alzheimer's research, research is breaking extraordinary new ground. VITO is on its way to becoming Canada's Centre for Pandemic Research, formally speaking, with construction of the manufacturing facility completed and funding received to establish the Level 4 containment capacity. A new report led by our researchers reveals how industry practices are driving critical threats to global freshwater systems, including groundwater depletion, metal contamination, plastic pollution, and water diversion. A research team here has developed an innovative biodegradable product with potential to mitigate plastic pollution around the world. Our researchers are leading a national team of 13 Canadian universities to develop three new climate science satellite instruments that will be launched into space as part of a large NASA mission. Its purpose is to deliver key data for improved forecasts of weather, air quality, and climate. And as global temperatures rise, wildfires are becoming more common. A new study by USASC hydrology researchers found that exposure to wildfire smoke causes glaciers to melt faster. We are the only university to have an entire quartet of instruments, two violins, a viola, and a cello, made by the Amati family over 400 years ago, three generations of them. Some of the finest string instruments found anywhere. This is thanks to the generosity and vision of Saskatchewan farmer Stephen Colbinson, who collected those instruments for decades, a uniquely Saskatchewan story. I wish I had the time to tell you all about it. This year has seen a first of its kind series here featuring these extraordinary instruments in four concert collaborations with some of Canada's best players, and one of those concerts is coming up shortly. Greystone Student Theatre has undertaken another superb season of performances directed by our faculty. Our Greystone Singers Choir, also faculty directed, has given many public concerts this year to large and packed venues, and it's so good that it has been selected to perform in June of 2024 in Carnegie Hall. In 2017, some of you will remember, we signed a first-of-its-kind agreement between a major university and a Canadian city that it's in, resulting in the research junction collaboration that supports the development of joint research projects to address contemporary urban issues for the benefit of Saskatoon residents. Adopting this year's research findings would add more renewable energy to the city's power grid, improve the removal of petrochemical contaminants from river water, reduce homelessness about among two SLGBTQ plus youth and revamp Saskatoon's business tax incentive policies. That too is an incomplete list of these, this year's research scholarly and artistic work activity, but the story it tells is that our research is well supported, ongoing, highly recognized, deeply engaged with local and universal challenges, and globally really competitive. 
Our research scholarly and artistic work and our signature areas are now interwoven with our sustainability strategy and with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This past year saw our inaugural cohort of six sustainability faculty fellows from five different colleges, each finding new ways to implement elements of sustainability within their curricula and equipping students, tomorrow's world leaders, to build a more sustainable future. We have defined what we mean by sustainability competencies for our learners. We launched a project last summer that collects an international team of researchers and partners from Canada, Germany, and South Africa to mentor emerging sustainability scholars and practitioners. We continue to find ways to decrease our GHG emissions in the near term. We have made sustainability a priority through our resource allocation decisions. The Horizon Fund has supported key activities within the strategy and we have a sustainability revolving fund to support renovation projects that produce utilities savings. These are some of the reasons why we received that ranking of 58 out of 1400 universities in the global THE impact rankings. It's always been clear to me that sustainability is not the work of one office or one single unit but something that every campus community member in every sector of the university can commit and contribute to. And so I thank you today for the work that you have done thus far and for your continued support of this important strategy which came out at the university about three and a half years ago. What of our commitment to reconciliation? There too, we've done a lot and there's a lot more to do. I still believe that our best work in this crucial area will result from the right mixture of patience and impatience. Sadly, fall term began amidst tragedy as we paused and mourned the tragic acts of violence that occurred at the James Smith Cree Nation in the village of Weldon at the beginning of September, you'll remember that. Then we offered support to students, staff and faculty who had connections to James Smith Cree Nation and the Gordon Oaks Red Bear Student Center served as a safe gathering place for members of the campus community. Our self-identified Indigenous student enrollments continue to rise at the graduate level. Undergraduate numbers have not been as positive during and since the pandemic, but much work is being done to reverse that recent trend and will be successful. An area with significant improvement compared to the fall is first to second year Indigenous undergraduate student retention. A jump of 30% from 63% to 92%. Our research scholarly and artistic work with Indigenous communities continues to increase in impact and importance. Three Canada research chairs have recently been awarded here in Indigenous areas. Our Prince Albert campus opened in person this past fall with a well-attended event, continues to see almost half of its students self-identify as Indigenous. That campus is going to be transformative for the many aspiring students in more remote northern communities who otherwise experience bar barriers to post-secondary opportunities. Most importantly though, this past year saw the release of the Du Bois Win Indigenous Truth Policy. That's the first of its kind in Canada, approved by our Board of Governors last July. The work has been led by our Office of the Vice Provost Indigenous Engagement and by an Indigenous task force comprising Indigenous elders, leaders and knowledge keepers and supported by an internal advisory circle of university representatives. I know some of all of that group are here today. The task force began its policy development work in January of 2022. It included delegates from Métis Nation Saskatchewan, the FSIN, Saskatoon Tribal Council, Prince Albert Grand Council, and the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. We commissioned and shared publicly an independent report by Indigenous rights expert Jean Taillé. Read it if you have not. It has contributed immensely to the national conversation and inform the university's continued implementation of policies and practices around the issue of people who falsely claim to be indigenous. And just last month, the implementation strategy for that policy was released. Again, the result of engagement and time and energy and commitment by our indigenous supporters and community colleagues. Why? Because they believe that what all of you are doing is important for the futures of Indigenous peoples and their communities. 
That policy and that implementation strategy lead the nation in perhaps the most meaningful and important Indigenous-centered work of today. It's widely recognized for what it is, groundbreaking, necessary, timely, respectful, consultative, and courageous. It leads me to say again that we continue to be participants and leaders, not bystanders, in the greatest cultural opportunity that this country has ever faced. Each of these advances in recognitions and awards, in rankings, in research scholarly and artistic work, and the funding for it, in sustainability, and in reconciliation. Each of these advances speaks to how we are moving confidently in the direction of being locally and globally engaged in having a positive impact on what the world needs. With each of these successes, we continue to make excellence and impact our priorities. With the progress we are making on reconciliation, we are shifting the culture from isolated locations in the university where indigenization was acknowledged quite a few years ago to every level and sector across the whole institution. The same can be said for our sustainability achievements. We've moved from seeing sustainability as the purview of an office in facilities to a commitment that spans our academic programming, our research scholarly and artistic work, and our UN SDG progress through our climate charter and our sustainability strategy. Research scholarly and artistic work with impact, progress on the UN SDGs, leadership and reconciliation, these are opportunities the world needs us to seize. We're doing so and we must continue to improve in each of them. What else can we identify that this university is uniquely situated and designed to drive and contribute to? <clears throat> Let's start by taking stock of the province we're named after and serve, and the country we play an increasingly influential role in moving forward. I say a lot of this to the provincial government and to the federal government, by the way, every opportunity that I have, and there are many of them. Almost half of Canada's arable land is here in this province, some of that is the most productive in the world. We're a global leader in the production of canola, lentils, and other pulse crops. Saskatchewan is the country's largest exporter of any province here. With 30% of global potash production, we're the largest producer of potash in the world. The global population is facing food insecurity, and this province and this university are at the heart of the answer to that challenge. This province and this university are at the heart of the answer to that challenge. Agriculture is one of our signature areas, but the challenge spans many of our strengths, from computer science to public policy, to engineering, to business, to communications, to nutrition, to public health, to veterinary medicine, and to our Global Institute for Food Security, and far more. Saskatchewan has the largest high-grade uranium deposits in the world, and it produces one quarter of the world's uranium supply at a time when fossil fuels and power sources have to evolve. We may well have more than 10% of the world's rare earth mineral deposits at a time when they are imperative to the production of new technologies the world depends upon. This province and this university can contribute to answering that challenge as well, carefully, sustainably, and responsibly. Energy and minerals for a sustainable future is one of our signature areas. Closer to home, Saskatoon remains the second fastest growing IT hub in Canada. I usually punctuate that by saying not Vancouver, not Edmonton, not Toronto, not Halifax, not Montreal, not Calgary, here, Saskatoon. Kitchener-Waterloo is the fastest growing IT hub in the country, and it's because there is a research intensive university in its midst deliberately playing a role in its innovation ecosystem. Many of the country's fastest growing companies are located here, according to the Globe and Mail. Almost all of them were started by our graduates and primarily employ our graduates. Many successful companies have emerged from this university. Skip the Dishes, Said Systems, International Road Dynamics, Picatick, Seven Shifts, Vendasta, Salido, just to name a few. Venture capital investment in Saskatoon and region has been increasing 
faster than in any other place on the entire continent. It's increased 15 fold over the last five years. We sit beside and we have a partnership with one of the continent's largest research parks, Innovation Place. We opened our first startup incubator, Opus, two months ago to provide aspiring entrepreneurs from here with the tools needed to build successful ventures on, camp on campus. Our Global Institute for Food Security now houses an ag tech IP portal that helps identify and advance intellectual property developed by it and an ideas portal for governments, academia and industry that have partnership proposals. We have the largest scientific infrastructure of any university in this entire country. We're leaders in the One Health area, thanks to an unparalleled congregation of health sciences units and labs at a time when the world faces a multitude of health-related challenges. We have an enviable strength in humanities and social sciences, in fine arts, public policy, public health, law, environmental programming and research, business and education. And that's just the beginning of a survey of our formal academic capacity. Supported by world-class researchers and students, we now attract from over 130 countries around the world to support innovation and entrepreneurship. No wonder we have reversed the talent out-migration of previous decades that saw our graduates leave the province in large numbers. Now, the majority stay here. Still, Canada's innovation strength as a whole has yet to reach its potential. Perhaps it's because the country is blessed with an abundance of natural resources and we don't experience the imperative of innovation the way other nations do who lack them. We perform poorly on the rankings devoted to measuring innovation globally, including being in the bottom third of the OECD index devoted to that. Crucially, the countries that rank the highest, South Korea, Israel, Germany, Sweden among them, I've visited them all, have universities that play a distinct role in their national innovation ecosystems and have nowhere near the natural resources that we enjoy. Our university has a key part to play in changing Canada's story. Our province and our country have the need, we have the capacity, the infrastructure, and the talent We've contributed much. What we need now is to move innovative and entrepreneurial thinking and activity throughout the university, as we have with reconciliation, research scholarly and artistic work and sustainability, into our curricula, into our research, into our academic goals, our hiring aspirations, our student recruitment, our space planning. I ask you to consider how this might be achieved from the perspective of your role in the university. It will benefit the province and the country, yes, but it will also benefit our thousands of students, many of whom are startup minded, all of whom are creative and innovative, and who long to see that culture being led from here. An innovative and entrepreneurial culture is not just the purview of business, engineering, or computer science. Those are imperative, and we've got really strong ones, and they're all very active in the space. But every part of the university can drive an entrepreneurial culture, from the arts to engineering, from public policy to ag tech. The majority of the C100 leaders, some of you are familiar with that group, companies started by Canadians in Silicon Valley, the majority of the leaders of the C100 companies earned humanities degrees at university. We can show how innovation complements sustainability, research scholarly and artistic work and reconciliation. Done correctly, it supports each of these and each supports innovation. Another opportunity before us, by the way, is the soon to be launched Be What the World Needs comprehensive campaign. And that is the largest in this university's history, but the largest ever seen in this province. Philanthropy and innovation approached strategically also go hand in hand. Innovation and entrepreneurship call us if we aspire to be the university the world needs. So do equity, diversity, and inclusion. And here, too, we're progressing well, but need to do more. In my statement on anti-racism and its call to action in June of 2020, 
I committed all senior leaders, vice presidents, deans, executive directors to engage in anti-racism, anti-oppression education. Dr. Verna St. Dennis and Ms. Liz Durrett and their team have prov been providing education and training to approximately 45 members of that senior leadership forum and to the president's executive committee. This has been a tremendous, uplifting process, I can tell you, involving hard work, a lot of time, introspection, and deliberate action, and it will continue. We've signed the Scarborough Charter that aims to address anti-black racism, and we now have a provost advisory committee tasked with designing its implementation. We vastly increased our Black History Month activity. Our three collegial bodies have adopted an EDI policy to support the university community in bringing to life the principles of diversity, equality, human dignity, and Manicetoan and reflecting them back in our daily interactions and decisions. Many of you in this room will have been part of one of those collegial bodies or another and will remember when that, strat when that policy came in front of you. It states that all members of the university community are expected to understand equity, diversity, and inclusion and are responsible for the implementation of such within their scope of influence and authority. That to me is a really key statement. When we brought it in front of council and council considered it um, twice, offered good suggestions to it, brought it back again, I remember that we keyed on that one statement. And that policy was brought to our three governing bodies, not necessarily just because we needed their approval as a university community, but because in bringing them there, we would emerge from there all feeling an accountability and responsibility for what's contained within it. It has remained for us to bring forward an implementation framework for that policy to give it life at every level of the university, in every academic unit, in every office, and in every building, just like we have done with sustainability and with the other um, activities that I just mentioned. That implementation framework will be in front of our Senate in just over two weeks' time, and in front of Council and then the Board before the end of June. I urge you, as I do regarding innovation and entrepreneurship, to consider how to achieve that strategy from the perspective of your role in the university. At this time in our history, and at this time in human history, failure to do so is not an option for a university aspiring to be one that the world needs. So colleagues, I'll finish with this. We've set our sights very high at this, at this university. We deserve to look at the horizon and beyond it. We deserve to see the positive impact we're having on a world that needs us more than ever. Are we doing enough on all these fronts? By no means. Our important work never stops. Do we have a clarity of vision as to where we need to go and what we need to focus on? Yes, we do. And so I thank you for your countless contributions to this university and by extension to the world we serve. Thank you very much.